good evening everyone and welcome to the special lecture uh, which is part of the 17th international conference on public policy uh, being hosted by cpp at iim bangalore uh, at the outset let me thank our sponsors bank of baroda and nabard uh, without whose generous support this event would not have been possible uh, for the special lecture we have the privilege of having with us dr chandramali uh, dr chandramali is a retired ias officer with more than 35 years of experience working with the government Uh, he's worked at various levels local state national he's also had experience working with uh, international multilateral organizations uh, dr chandamalli uh, he's currently uh, managing director of the chennai international center uh, in his role with the government he handled various roles and portfolios uh, he worked with uh, the personnel department uh, handling capacity building recruitment uh, and career development for government officials at various levels uh, in his role with uh, indirect taxation he handled the transition from uh, the old sales tax regime uh, to value added taxes uh, later he was part of the gst drafting committee which handled the transition to what is now the gst regime uh, he has also been active in urban development he was uh, commissioner of uh, coimbatore he was deputy commissioner of then madras uh, in the special lecture by uh, shri gopal krishn gandhi yesterday he mentioned that uh, one of india's signature policy achievements has been the fact that we've conducted a census regularly uh, once every 10 years uh, and as policy researchers and practitioners we can imagine the complexity of of such an exercise uh, for a country as diverse as india uh, with a population of more than 1 billion uh, dr chandramalli was the census commissioner registrar general of india for the 2011 census and that that's a data set i can confidently say most policy researchers have used at some point uh, in their career uh, Uh, for this effort he received the president's gold medal uh, in addition to his bureaucratic responsibilities dr chandramalli is also an expert on the arts crafts and uh, world heritage sites of tamil nadu about which he's written extensively uh, you know i could go on and on about dr chandramalli's achievements but uh, uh, to keep it short and you know to hand over the stage to him uh, uh, i'll i'll uh, keep this brief here uh, to the audience i'll request you to keep your questions for the end of the session uh, we budgeted time for a q and a Uh, so without further ado let me hand over to dr chandra professor shriram professor arpit members of the faculty and uh, dear colleagues it's indeed a privilege and a pleasure to be here amongst you to deliver this special lecture i know you have had eminent people coming uh, very eminent in fact you have had the privilege of listening to Shri Gopal Krishna Gandhi, I am told, and uh, many other eminent speakers. So I do hope you find uh, this lecture as engaging as was theirs. Thank you very much for that kind introduction too. So today we, when we, when I was invited, I was asked to choose a topic. So I said that okay, what is really ailing public policy in today's age and i said with my experience it was just rushing into policy and then trying to figure out you know whether we are on the right path or not uh, and i thought empirical evidence was the missing link in this entire policy framework policy making framework but as i will uh, come to you later in my speech i suppose this is a common phenomena across the globe it's not only us but the theory itself recognizes that you know public policy in most cases cannot be totally empirical it cannot be a very scientific empirical basis to public policy and there would be a lot of missing gaps so let's see uh, some of them before that let me start because i was also briefed that it should have some theoretical grounding so i may not be very deep i do not claim to be an expert in that i will not make a deep dive but whatever little uh, dive i have taken has again made my belief stronger that we in india are no different from what is happening in the rest of the world and i took great joy in that so let me start with the formal presentation first let me set out what are the major challenges that public public policy faces or policy makers face in the world today today is a world plagued with poverty 
unemployment, inequality, ill health, illiteracy, unrest, and conflict. The gap between the rich and the poor is widening. Violence is on the upward trend. And materialism, greed, and corruption is rampant. Terrorism, radicalization, extremism, and mindless hate is causing deep fissures in the societal and national fabric. Global warming and economic meltdown have made, uh, have made sustainability of the human race critical. And degradation of human values has made mankind soulless. The leadership challenge today is, as Yuval Harari puts it, to search for new ways and kinds of people to solve our complex problems, unquote. The foremost challenge, apart from whatever I've said, for the leadership and policy making is the erosion of credibility of policy makers among the people they govern. In a situation where the widespread feeling among the people is that policy makers are unresponsive, insensitive, lack integrity, and are neither transparent nor accountable, the citizenry has become hostile, it has become belligerent, it has become distrustful and has got alienated from the policymakers. And I think that is the single biggest challenge that any policymaker, no, it's not India alone. It's a question of, you know, the credibility crisis is a phenomena which policymakers all over the world are suffering from. And this is something which, you know, we will have to find solutions to uh, if we want to make our policy uh, based on, on the benefit for the maximum number. Public life and public law, and I would like to quote Justice Krishna here, here uh, he says, is a functional social coalition that must strictly observe ethics in public life, the erosion of which leads to the negation of liberty, equality, and fraternity, and promotes the pollution of an acquisitive society where the few enjoy patrician pleasures, corrupt the instrumentalities of governance, and revel in authoritarianism with none to challenge their subversive operations, unquote. Ethics here, what he talks of ethics here is not restricted to integrity alone. Let me say it's a multi-dimensional concept that he's talking about, uh, ethics, which includes integrity but does not mean integrity alone. It includes, among others, legality of government action, rationality in policy and decision making, evolving a sense of responsibility, ensuring accountability, strengthening work commitment, creating excellence, facilitating a spirit of individual and organizational goals, developing responsiveness, showing compassion, protecting the national interest, safeguarding the spirit of justice, bringing transparency, and of course, elevating integrity. You would see that integrity is important, but it is not the most important. All the other uh, factors which I mentioned have equal uh, merit. A white canvas indeed. Each of the above merits detailed exposition. However, I intend to dwell upon one aspect only, namely rationality in policy and decision making. And that is where the empirical evidence comes in. I must confess that I am a practitioner and hardly know about the theory of policy making as an academic discipline. However, the invitation to speak at this forum led me to quickly browse through some literature on the subject. As I said, I was delighted to learn from my cursory dive into the subject that we as policymakers in India are no different from our counterparts worldwide. The same noise, the same clutter, and the same messiness pervades the area of policymaking universally. Policy cycles in theory, are supposed to be linear and orderly. There are distinct stages which have been identified. Agenda setting, policy formulation, legitimation, implementation, evaluation, policy maintenance, its succession, its termination, etc. These are all, in theory, they say, you know, it's an orderly one after the other, it comes. In practice, elected policymakers are supposed to be aided by expert policy analysts. They are supposed to make legitimate choices. And public servants are supposed to carry out the, uh, 
diktats of the policy makers, and analysts are supposed to assess the results with the aid of scientific evidence. However, in practice, in the place of cycles, the policy making environment consists of many actors making and influencing choices at many levels of government. There is a proliferation of institutions with different rules and norms, and often these rules and norms are unwritten or implicit that are dynamically contributing to the process. The policy inputs vary according to which organization takes the lead, how its actors understand the problems, the rules they follow, and the practices they encourage. Then there are policy networks that influence policy making. Many of you who are students of public policy would be part of these networks. So these, this also depends, the nature of the, uh, of the policy networks also has a profound influence on the uh, policy that is finally made. Closed net networks restrict access to policy makers and this dictates the source of evidence that is collected and who the participants in the process are. On the behavioral plane, the policy is also subject to how dominant entrenched ideas or core beliefs of policy makers are and how open they are to adopt new policy solutions. And lastly, policy conditions and events like social or economic crisis often prompt policy makers to focus attention on certain issues and neglect others. Another set of factors that play a role in policy making are one, the values of the policy makers and whether these are consistent with the facts. Two, whether policy makers can rank policy aims in a logical and consistent manner. Three, whether policy makers are successful in gathering information comprehensively. And lastly, whether they possess the cognitive ability to process the information gathered. Very rarely do policy makers operate in such ideal conditions. They end up adopting what is called bounded rationality by using rules of thumb to limit their analysis and produce decisions that are good enough. They take rational shortcuts based on fit for purpose sources of information combined with their own beliefs emotions, habits, and familiarity to identify policy problems and solutions. What emerges is a strategy of trial and error to deal with uncertain and dynamic environments. Very often, they weave arguments to persuade the public, and this, in theory, you call storytelling, to approach a policy problem and its solution in a particular way. At other times, policymakers are just making policy based on emotional judgments and stereotypes, which is a very dangerous situation. Now, the literature on the discipline of public policy talks about several theories. A quick overview of some of these are, the policy community's theory is based on the premise that the state is large and crowded. Power is shared across government and sectors and subsectors. Elected policymakers can only pay attention to a tiny proportion of issues for which they are responsible and they ignore the rest. They delegate responsibility to other actors such as bureaucrats and bureaucrats in turn rely on specialist organizations for information and advice. Organizations trade such resources for access to and influence within the government. Therefore, most public policy according to this theory is conducted through small and specialist communities at a level of government not particularly visible to the public so this probably you would have come across in quite a few sectors where there are think tanks, where there are consultants who particularly guide a particular sector towards a certain way of policy making. The other theory which is called the punctuated equilibrium theory suggests that policymakers at the macro level can only pay attention to a tiny proportion of all possible issues and that attention lurches from issue to issue. This produces sometimes hyper-incremental change in many fields and profound change in very small number of fields. The multi-level governance and polycentric governance theory similarly suggests that there is no single source of authority in political systems. Central governments cooperate with other actors to produce the rules to which many policy-making organizations then agree. 
Then there is the policy succession, inheritance, and historical institutionalism theory, which suggests that most new policies are revisions of old policy. Governments begin by accepting the commitments of their predecessors and choices in the past, contribute to the formation of the rules of organizations operating in the present. Studies which have studied implementation suggest that policy is finally what is delivered at the bottom by actors who are themselves subject to many rules. These actors use their discretion, judgment, and training to fulfill a proportion of what the policymaker aims. What starts at the top and what gets translated at the bottom probably may not have any relation to each other because each one is interpreting that policy in his own way, subject to his own rules and the organization that he or she belongs to. Complexity theory again identifies a tendency for policy to emerge from complex policy making systems, often at a local level. And policymakers at the central level can hardly uh, control the outcomes. Similarly, the social construction and policy design theory suggests that policymakers make quick moral choices based on social stereotypes, and these choices have a profound effect on policy. I think this basically covers a wide range of theory which I could make out through my cursory uh, dive into this subject. Uh, so what, what is this evidence that we are talking of? Well, there seems to be a hierarchy of evidence also. And researchers often place a lot of emphasis on randomized control trial as one of the gold standards of uh, evidence gathering. Some other people say expertise ranks and practitioner experience and service user feedback is also very important in policy making. Others, based on their, uh, their own approach, they say experience is more relevant. Collecting evidence and collecting, uh, doing randomized trials, etc., uh, often the policy making uh, environment does not allow the luxury of collecting all that evidence and doing a proper uh, appreciation of the evidence. So these are uh, finally what happens. The policymakers do not make these choices consistently. One or the other theory often plays a role. Often they take ad hoc decisions to exercise power and use evidence in patchy ways. In short, there is a confusing mixture of strategies in the context of a process that can never be evidence-based in totality. A consistent policy cycle used by a core group of rational policymakers and analysts at the heart of government does not exist in the real world. There are many policymakers spread across many levels and types of government and pursuing their own ideas about how to combine good evidence and good policy making. And these policymakers are always acting on limited information. They employ cognitive and organizational shortcuts. Now come to India. The public policy environment here is no different. There is an increasing role of different actors both local and global, and multiple voices in the governance processes. Attempts to forge stronger links between research and policy and mainstream public policy education are also afoot, but making baby steps still, I would say. Reforms to professionalize the bureaucracy by building competence or hiring experts on the market have also been initiated. The famous uh, Karmayogi policy which I happen to be a part of, as well as the lateral entry of professionals into the bureaucracy. Now, these were also attempts by the government to bring in some kind of a outside uh, uh, competence or professionalism within the government. But uh, they have been very minimal uh, as far as uh, you know, government of India is concerned. New discourses, such as neoliberalism, good governance, Gender mainstreaming, etc., have created their own demand for greater accountability and transparency. The thrust towards decentralization that was prominent during the 1980s and 1990s is seeing a reversal with strong centralizing tendencies. A process of involving users in public service delivery or in the management of public infrastructure through deliberate policy intervention have been carried out in several sectors. 
and public policy as an academic discipline in India is also seeing considerable change. Earlier, it was only economists who used to be involved. And now we have political scientists, we have sociologists and anthropologists who have started focusing on public policy in India. Issues like why policies are formulated and designed in a particular way have started receiving attention from social scientists, which is a welcome trend. In a sense, the policy environment in India has been shaped by a curious intersection of globalization and localization, growing demands for transparency and accountability, and a growing intellectual interest in the study of policy implementation uh, processes, the professionalization of the bureaucracy, and an institutionalization of the research policy interface. Against this backdrop, let us see some concrete examples of policy making on in, in India. I had the opportunity of being intimately involved with a significant reform measure, the GST. Uh, I actively participated in the GST Council deliberations and was a member of several key committees and a member of the board of the GSTN. Uh, I was also involved with the implementation of the policy at the state level in crucial years. Now, shades of all classic theories mentioned above are seen in the formulation of this policy. First, we were working with limited information. While we knew about the implementation of GST in other countries, we had no national experience of such a destination-based tax. The studies that were conducted by NIPFP, I'm, you had a lot of discussion yesterday on that, I'm told, were theoretical and were subject to a lot of questions by experts. The study by the Chief Economic Advisor, Edwin Subramaniam, also had many skeptics. The states had their own systems and studies which predicted a significant loss of income to manufacturing states. In short, we were proceeding on a bounded rationality by using rules of thumb and were limiting our analysis to produce decisions that were good enough. They were not the best fit. It is good enough decisions were, were taken. Policy makers were weaving arguments to persuade the public to approach a policy problem and its solution in a particular way, storytelling. Each state had its own experience and interest. Out of all this noise, this messiness, a workable policy emerged. Afterwards, based on experience and data, changes started happening and continue to happen. With the introduction of electronic systems, there is now a flood of data, which is being analyzed geography-wise, sector-wise, industry-wise, and even dealer-wise. A similar thrust on the direct access side and an active interchange of data across systems has brought about a sea change in the business climate of the country. The buoyancy in revenue is just one aspect of this change. The ability to analyze and predict based on real-time data is a value add that is immeasurable. Thus, out of what seemed a maddening cacophony, a melody emerged, and let's hope this melody matures into a symphony. Uh, so this is one example how different actors, different voices, different levels of government all come together and a policy emerges, but that is not a perfect policy, and therefore iterations happen, and that is often seen as inefficient policy making. But given the system, given the structure of the system of governance in India, I think this is how policy is made. And uh, the, the silver lining is that this is the first time that the states and the center got together on a common platform and decided to sink their own interests into a common interest for the country. I think that is that holds out a lot of lessons for future policy too. Now let me take another example that I have been personally involved with, the Aadhaar. The Home Ministry, based on a report and recommendation of the Subramaniam Committee, which was set up in the aftermath of the Kargil War, decided to create a national population register and issue identity cards to citizens as a security initiative. A unique identity number was an essential part of this project. This was a task that I took up as the Registrar General of India, and subsequently based on recommendations of Sri Nandan Nilakeni, the Aadhaar project, which also had a unique identity as its core, was launched. The objective of this project was completely different from that of the NPR. However, both these initiatives went through stages of confrontation, duplication, and finally compromise. Different actors, different organizations, different rules, different objectives, Again, an example of extreme messiness in the policy-making process. 
today the the uses of aadhar and the uh, benefits that have accrued from it everybody knows it is ubiquitous but the way that policy evolved and way it was implemented in the initial phases i think shows a lot of what theory we talked about right the noise the messiness the duplication so uh, so this is another example now let me talk of another sector completely different sector where this concept of limited or bounded rationality and how policy emerges from there in the power sector a new policy was introduced which made it mandatory to use coal with less than 34% ash content in thermal generation stations one of the alternatives for the tamil nadu electricity board of which i was a part was to set up coal washeries in the pit head and transport washed coal from the mines located in odisha and west bengal when we led a delegation to coal india to negotiate this we had different members in the team the mechanical engineer in our team was excited because he was getting evenly sized coal the electrical engineer was happy that he was getting better grade coal but both were views which were from their own narrow perspective when viewed from a management perspective there were a number of issues firstly the washed coal had a calorific value that was less than that of raw coal secondly there would be a variation in the quantity of coal loaded at the pit head and what was received at the generating station on account of drying during transit and we used to transport coal by ship first by rail then by ship and again by road and rail so by the time when we loaded with the moisture the coal would have been weighing several tons more and in the course of transit it would have got dried up and there would be the usual problems of audits and objections and people getting into trouble so this is going to be something which we had not seen at all when we uh, went out to set up a washery in uh, in the pit head then there was a problem of running washeries in a different state with different and difficult labor conditions and lastly there was a problem of dumping the rejects almost 35% of the coal would go as rejects so where would we dump it and which state would allow us to dump it they would charge us dumping uh, uh, cess so out of all this noise which was coming we finally decided that blending the indian coal with better quality coal would serve the purpose of meeting this 34% ash and that is a policy which is continuing today in most thermal stations across the country now first of all why was this policy made environmental ministry thought that okay we should take care of environmental norms but most of our coal is poor quality coal most of our power stations have been built only to use that quality of coal so if we wanted to use higher quality of coal we had to make a huge amount of investment to tap the waste heat that was generated so instead of looking at it in a in a, in a comprehensive way with limited information each one was going forth and setting up you know a complex uh, investment decision was being taken so this is again an example how policy makers often go with a lot of limited information but what finally emerges is out of something else let me also cite a few examples from my own experience how we take ad hoc decisions that use evidence in patchy ways rather how a confusing mixture of strategies are used in policy making that are basically intuitive and can never be evidence based let me cite one example uh, malaria was endemic in parts of chennai city the usual measures to combat this was the use of anti larval oil fogging use of pesticides etc this involved a huge amount of expenditure and the effort was proving ineffective as the number of cases was not declining a spatial analysis of the data revealed that areas that did not have pipe water supply or where the supply of pipe water was irregular sh were showing more cases a field investigation then revealed that drinking water was being stored in cisterns and tanks in this area 
where active breeding of the female Anopheles mosquito was taking place, leading to malaria. Now, this led us to formulate a policy to systematically cover these water storage devices with impermeable lids. The building rules were amended to provide for hermetical sealing of wells, overhead tanks, and indoor water storing devices. This rapidly brought down the incidence of the disease. And this was a case where we connected the dots between water shortage and storage of water within the house and the breeding of mosquitoes leading to malaria. Whereas the traditional approach or the policy was go with some chemicals, go with fish, go with nets and this was the way we were going about. But this was using evidence coming from various sources and I'll uh, point out later, this is what big data is doing today. Catching dots here, they're connecting those dots and coming out with policy which is absolutely essential. So very often it's intuitive. Where you go by experience, go by the uh, advice of field people and then come out with a policy which has a very effective uh, result or outcome. Sometimes evidence exists but we don't know how to find it. An example, uh, have you heard of CBM in the field of solid waste management? I'm sure none of you would have heard it because it's a term which I have coined. It stands for Clutch Brake Management, CBM, Clutch and Brake Management. Now what does it mean? Garbage clearance is a chronic problem in all cities. Most modern city corporations have a fleet of trucks and other vehicles to clear garbage. If the fleet of vehicles moved out in time and in sufficient numbers, the garbage would be cleaned. Otherwise, it would lie on the streets, creating a nuisance and spreading disease. The general observation was that on days that the fleet march out was poor, the complaints of garbage were more. An analysis of the problem of fleet deployment revealed that the foremost reason for poor vehicle march out was the wearing out of the clutch plate and the brake lining. And these were two uh, parts which were never in stock. And we had to go through a cycle of procurement which it took its own time. And in the meantime, the garbage remained unclear. The lack of a sufficient inventory of these pairs led to an increase in vehicle failures and subsequently a dirtier city. Managing a proper inventory of spares was the solution. Again, a correlation between unconnected data elements leading to a solution to a public problem. So, it is this evidence which is already there, but it is where we are looking for it. We were looking at the sweepers not sweeping the uh, garbage from the streets. We were talking of people dumping garbage at wrong times of the day, not like America or other countries where you are supposed to keep your garbage inside your house and not bring it out of the streets. All sorts of things were thought about. But like that uh, poem which says that for want of a nail, the what was lost. Uh, this was a problem of clutch and break, which uh, we had to really find. And once we took care of that problem, we had a, a cleaner city because once they marched out, they had to collect garbage and therefore there was a cleaner city. Now, am I therefore suggesting that public policy cannot be based on empirical evidence? Definitely not. Such an evidence does exist and should as far as possible be used for policy formulation. Considerations such as quality of the data available, its accuracy, quantity of the data available, whether, whether it is based on total data or on random samples, cost of collecting the data, and the timeliness of the data is very important. However, despite limitations, it is possible to give an empirical basis to policy making. Let us examine what is available and what are the limitations of these sources. One, it is a matter of justifiable pride that the Census of India is considered the largest administrative exercise in the world and is acknowledged worldwide for its robustness and credibility. Till the recent one that ought to have been conducted in 2021, India conducted a continuous series of decadal censuses since 1881. I have had the privilege of counting the million plus population of India thrice during my time as the Registrar General uh, for the Census 2011. The National Population Register, the Socio-Economic and Caste Census, 
and the Census of India were done during my time. So valuable data on the housing stock and characteristics of the population are provided by the Census of India. The data sets are available by gender and many are available at the level of village and town wards. The drawback, however, of this data is it is available once a decade. And the initial data sets are available within a very short period, but others take a long time. If you look at quite a number of policies which have come out, like the Swachh Bharat or the Beti Bachao, Beti Padao, all these were based, or uh, Har Ghar Jal or Nal, all these were based on data sets provided by the uh, decadal census. The next available option is the sample surveys conducted by the office of the RGI, the CSO, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare and others. <coughs> the sample registration survey, for example, provides reliable annual estimates on vital events such as state and national level indicators like birth rate, death rate, infant mortality rates, maternal mortality rates and total fertility rates. The annual health survey was also a very rich survey, uh, repository of data at the district level. The National Family Health Surveys, NFHS, uh, of which NFHS 5 is the latest, also provides very robust sets of data which can be used and which is being used for most of the health uh, policies of the country. Similarly, the national sample surveys are huge national uh, based on huge national samples which collects data on a variety of socio-economic subjects. And these are also used very, very effectively in policy making. We also have other systems like the civil registration system, the medically certified causes of death, and the survey of causes of death of mortality by cause. Now that is again a very vital source of information about why people are dying, where are they dying, what causes. Uh, so these are uh, surveys which can be used by researchers uh, to base policy making on empirical evidence. However, I must point out that the basic problem of these data sets is that they lack standardization and are not timely. Census data, for example, is organized with Revenue Village as its basic unit. Rural Development Departments use Gram Panchayats. Electricity data is organized based on collection circles. Education Department follows the school district. Police has police stations. So I can go on like this. In brief, the data sets are in silos and do not speak to each other. And there is no common unit of collection that would enable meaningful comparison. This is the biggest hindrance to policy formulation. Despite this, it is possible to use these data sets using modern analytics, data analytics uh, to make a meaningful uh, sense of all these different data sets and coming out with rational policy. Now, evidence is also available at local levels too if we care to. Let me cite a few examples of how data or use of data significantly help me in decision making. Drug inventory is a problem in most large organizations including the health department. For us, it was a huge problem because we used to run hundreds of hospitals and dispensaries and I used to get voluminous data on whether paracetamol was available, how many strips were available in a particular dispensary at a particular point of time. Now what use was that data to me as a policymaker? I mean collecting that data from hundreds of sources and telling me that there are two strips in that uh, dispensary, there are ten strips in that, hardly helped me. What I needed was a proper analytics of the data which, used, which tells me in time that look, you are reaching a critical level of inventory and you have to start reordering. Once this realization came, we just started looking at, uh, at the reorder levels. And this reorder levels, knowing government uh, and how it functions, reordering takes a long time. There are tenders to be called, there are uh, bids to be taken, compared, a lot of pressures, etc. So it takes a huge uh, time to finish the cycle. So once you got this alert well in time, this problem could be sorted out in a more scientific manner. So it's not only that you have data, 
But how do you analyze the data? What do you gain, uh, gain from the data? And this is where policy scientists could come in to really uh, help the policy makers in coming out with such uh, indicators that would help them in their day-to-day -day, uh, functioning. Again, data is there, but the use to which we put it determines its effectiveness. We used to weigh every ton of garbage which was thrown from the city by establishing electronic weigh bridges at the dumping grounds. And people used to say, but why are you measuring something and it's a waste and you're going to measure that uh, what great purpose is served by knowing that 3,500 tons of garbage were really taken out of the city today. So when we were only dealing with the quantitative uh, indicators, it was not making much of a sense. But when we started slicing and dicing this data and started analyzing it from the angle of which area, how much of the, uh, garbage was lifted, how many vehicles carried how much per trip per uh, month, now, this gave us a completely different set of matrices, which actually started a war in the city of Chennai, where people started stealing garbage from the other guy's uh, territory, and then they would come and fight. No, no, this guy picked up from my territory, not uh, from his own territory. They started putting stones in the uh, in the vehicles so that they got more weight per trip. And often we found that a three-ton truck was carrying eight tons because it was permanently loaded with some stones and uh, debris. So it is again data, but how to use that data? And this is a training which many of the civil servants just don't know. So public officials need to know not only that data is there, but what can you really get out of that data? How can you make different kinds of meaningful analysis from that data? And really, can you use it as a uh, indicator which would improve efficiency, not only for uh, a punitive uh, kind of an action, but for a development kind of an action. So this is something which we need to use, uh, uh, learn about the various uses that data can be put to. Another example, every day we used to get hundreds and hundreds of complaints. Now these complaints used to be uh, taken. And we would come out with a quantitative analysis that uh, 1 lakh complaints were received and 98,000 uh, complaints have been disposed. Disposal is 98 percent and that's it. But then somebody said, what is the point in looking at quantity alone? Let's look at the quality of the data and look at root cause analysis. So once we started doing that, for example, the maximum number of complaints in the railways was about cancellations and not getting the cancelled money back. Now, when we pointed out from the Department of uh, Administrative Reforms that this is the main complaint, please look into the root cause and find out a solution for this. Immediately, there was a drop in the public complaints, which was almost uh, negligible complaints started coming from that particular sector. So, this is where, you know, there are dime a dozen uh, solutions like this which can be found by using that data in a more intelligent way. And this is again what policy makers have to be attuned to. And today when we talk of big data, and I'll be talking about that a little while later, there are techniques where you can take so many different sources of data, may not be collected data, it, it is there, it is there for the uh, picking or the plucking, it is how you make use or how do you take that data. So while improving the existing data sources is vital, modern approaches thrown up by big data analysts is an important step to bridge the gap and provide the missing link. Search engines, sensors, smartphones, GPS, web clicks, social media feeds, these are all new and exciting frontiers that must be explored. Digital data is expanding at an exponential pace. It is estimated that it is more than doubling every three years. Uh, maybe it has become faster now. And the processing power of computers is also expanding to not only keep pace but outstrip the available data. This has given us the power to make predictions more accurately. This branch of computer science that applies math to a huge quantities of data to info 
data because you have consented, informed consent. And information is given to you in 10, 20 pages of fine print, which you finally say, I accept. So this is thrown out of the window, the most common strategies that are used for data protection, namely informed consent, option to opt out, and anonymization. In fact, a very famous example is of using the US gave data which is supposedly anonymized of Japanese uh, residents during the World War. But that anonymization did not have any sense because they gave the street. They said, how many Japanese are there in that street for, oh, I anonymized it, I have not given his name. But how difficult was it to find that these are the four uh, people? So this is, again, you know, it has made all these strategies absolutely redundant. In a world where not only governments, but private enterprises constantly invading your personal space, public policy is still clinging to a fig leaf. Another danger is that data is being used to predict propensity. I already mentioned insurance premium is based on data driven predictions of your life. You are being penalized based on a prediction and not on an actual occurrence. If you extend this to other situations, it is a terrifying scenario. The dictatorship of data brought about by misusing big data can turn into a source of repression and manipulation. I think new policies and principles are required for this age of big data, and this is the biggest challenge for public policy. In conclusion, I would say empirical evidence in policy making is the missing link. And to paraphrase a quotation, evidence based policy making has failed, but it must succeed. As the science of data analytics improves, new avenues are opening. Policy makers and scholars must seize this opportunity to improve the lives and livelihoods of people, but at the same time protect them from the tyranny of data or evidence. Thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, for giving me this chance to, to really analyze what we have been doing in the last 37 years, at least personally, in government and how we have been approaching different uh, solutions based on a variety of our own intuitions, call it experience, call it uh, evidence, whatever it is. So thank you very much.